Good morning, good afternoon and good evening ladies and gentlemen. We would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you at the nice global conclave from the laps of the beautiful Himalayas where the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is located. The think tank was established in the month of February in the year 2016. It undertakes independent research in the field of international relations, foreign policy, security studies and development. NICE has four research centers, China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, Non-Traditional Security Studies and Security and Strategic Studies. The institute focuses on eight research topics, climate change and energy, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, refugee and migration, China's Belt and Road Initiative, Border and Transboundary Water Politics, Indo-Pacific Affairs, Disaster Management and International Economy and Development. Previously, NICE has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe. It was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at NICE. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. Well, thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all. NICE Global Conclave is the flagship event of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. The theme of the three-day conference is connecting Nepal to the world by bringing in leaders, diplomats, business leaders and scholars from all around the globe. The objective of this conclave is to introduce Nepal to the world and at the same time update the Nepalese policymakers and experts about the fast-changing geopolitics, which will help Nepal to reshape its foreign policy to achieve its national goal. This is the session key of the conference. The session that we are going to have is on nuclear disarmament, arms control and non-proliferation. And to chair and moderate this session, uh, it is a real pleasure to have Dr. Manta with us. Dr. Sethi is a distinguished fellow at Center for Air Power Studies at New Delhi. She is the recipient of K. Subramaniam Award in 2014 and commendation by Air Staff Chief in 2020. She has authored several books and articles and she is also a member at Prime Minister Informal Group on Disarmament in 2012 and on the Executive Board of the Indian Pogba Society. She is also working currently as a board member at Asia Pacific Leadership Network APLN and a consultant with Nuclear Abolition Forum. So without any further ado, I'd like to request the chair to take over. Thank you very much. It is such a pleasure uh, and really an honor, uh, actually, to be chairing a session on this particular subject as part of the conclave that has been so ably put together by NICE. Uh, for an institution which was born only in 2016, to be able to do something like this of connecting Nepal to the rest of the world in such a great manner of putting you know, scholars, practitioners, academics together, I think you're doing a great job. So my compliments on that to the organizers, uh, Mr. Pramod Jaiswal and his entire team. Um, and also, I think it's such a privilege for me to chair this session uh, with the kind of stalwarts that I have on the panel. Each one of the panelists has uh, excelled in the work on non-proliferation, disarmament and arms control. And there is so much that they bring to this table. Now, since the subject is so vast, and we were not given a, a sub theme or a, or a tagline uh, to you know, focus our uh, attention on. Uh, I took the liberty of uh, allocating certain questions and topics to each one of the panelists so that we can have some uh, focused discussion on this vast issue of non-proliferation, disarmament and arms control. 
there is a sense of pessimism i think that everyone feels today when you look at uh, the picture on disarmament uh, non proliferation arms control we see the arms control architecture crumbling a lot of the treaties have fallen by the wayside in the last uh, couple of years uh, on disarmament uh, it is ironical that we have the ban treaty the treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons that entered into force earlier this year in january uh, and yet disarmament is nowhere on the horizon as of now in fact if anything we see that there is a division between the nuclear weapon states and the non nuclear weapon states uh, which is very stark in the ban treaty of course and which is likely to spill into the non proliferation treaty also uh, and also on uh, the non proliferation front uh, you know just about uh, a decade ago uh, there were several articles that came out to suggest that the norm of uh, non proliferation is well in place that the risk of proliferation new countries acquiring nuclear weapons is no longer existing and just 10 years down the line today we don't uh, speak about it with such confidence we are worried about the fact that more countries will be attracted to nuclear weapons because of the landscape that is developing on disarmament and arms control so we are going to try and uh, you know put these uh, threads together uh, in order to build a picture of what it's looking like on this particular field as i mentioned to you each one of the speakers is very knowledgeable about these subjects and i'm sure it's going to be a challenge for them to condense everything that they know and want to speak about in just about 7 to 8 minutes but i have very strict orders from the organizers to maintain time uh, extremely carefully uh, so please do remember that you are not going to speak more than 7 to 8 minutes so try to condense your arguments accordingly Let me start then uh, by calling on Ambassador Mark Finno, uh, a dear friend uh, and a person I respect a lot professionally. Uh, he's the head of Arms uh, Proliferation and Diplomatic Trade Craft at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Um, every time I have met him, I've learned a lot about how uh, issues need to be framed in today's times, given the challenges in mind. Uh, so I asked him to give us. Uh, Uh, a lay of the land on non proliferation arms control and disarmament where does he think we are what are the challenges why is there such a sense of pessimism uh, about these issues and if at all where do you see the silver lining on any of these issues uh, so mark can i call upon you please to take the floor now thank you very much uh, manpreet uh, thank you uh, for the organizers uh, for the invitation Yes, uh, on this issue of uh, disarmament, arms control, non-proliferation, as you said, uh, the, the mood, the feeling is is fairly uh, pessimistic, fairly gloomy, because we have seen actually set a set of challenges, uh, mostly during the Trump administration, when um, the, you know Trump uh, withdrew from very important treaties that have been. Uh, developed over the years and that contributed to maintaining some strategic stability such as the uh, intermediate nuclear uh, um, weapon systems uh, um, force treaty um, the uh, up, the open skies treaty the arms trade treaty um, and then some also uh, provisions about uh, anti person landmines that uh, you know the US ha ha hadn't joined but that even uh, trump um uh, uh you know worsen the the attitude of the united states uh you know this set of setbacks actually were really was were a, a blow to the uh, um, arms control community and and uh, overall uh, strategic stability and then of course we had uh, all the challenges due to the uh, pandemic with a number of very important meetings like the non proliferation treaty review conference postponed um of course most most other processes or negotiations stopped frozen and paradoxically at the same time when world gdp was uh, shrinking by 4.4% military spending was increasing by 2.6% uh, and this seems you know more and more shocking more and more outrageous outrageous now um 
uh, as you said, there is some silver lining or some good news in, in, in spite of this bad news. First, well, Scott, you mentioned the, uh, the BAN Treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which of course is rejected by nuclear powers and their allies. It's, it's controversial, but it's, it's a new step. It's, it opens a new page, a new era. And of course, time will tell how effective it can be, but it's, it's, it's a very important event. Then, of course, there was the extension of the New START Treaty by the Biden administration and, and, and the agreement just concluded in Geneva with uh, Putin on starting a new set of talks, st strategic stability talks, which will have an arms control component, hopefully to develop a new treaty uh, for after a new start and a so-called strategic stability, confidence building measures, etc. So uh, again, uh, that's that's good news. We'll have to see how it, it develops, but it, it's it's good uh, decision. And then the third good uh, piece of good news is the red deal, the JCPOA, which was Biden's uh, pledge. Uh, it's being discussed at the moment in Vienna. Um, everybody's hopeful that they will find an agreement to allow for the US to re uh, rejoin the agreement and Iran to come back to full compliance with it. And then there were a number of uh, other points that didn't hit the, the headlines, but what are important for the arms control uh, community, uh, the agreement on of the open-ended working group on cybersecurity, thanks to the mediation of uh, Switzerland. Uh, and then also something that hardly anybody noticed that China acceded to the arms trade treaty. Again, China was uh, a supporter of the treaty initially, but it abstained from joining. And now it's part of this big community that is still lacking, of course, some of the major arms exporters like the US or Russia. Uh, so these are um, you know, important points that we should uh, build on. Of course, there are still challenges. The NTT review conference will still be postponed pro probably to uh, January next year, and there will be still polarization about the, the TPNW. Uh, as we see, uh, this happen is happening in a context of arms race, deployment of new systems, modernization, even increase in arsenals, which hadn't taken place uh, um, for some time, like uh, by the UK, and, and an increase in nuclear risk, the use of uh, uh, nuclear weapon. So um, again, all this will be very important to watch during the um, post New Start uh, talks, the uh, stabi st strategic stability talks. But this will not, of course, um, be sufficient because we are still dealing with a number of regional crises, of course, between NATO and Russia. Um, in the Middle East, even if JCPOA is restored, we still are in a conflict situation with a lot of um, potential for escalation into actual conflict. Korean Peninsula, obviously, un unsolved uh, issue, um, un uh, unsolved business. So that remains to be, again, put, put back on the table. Um, and of course, in your region, South Asia, urgency of uh, risk reduction measures because of this um, you know escalate risk of escalation from conventional conflict to to nuclear conflict with the importance of confidence and transparency building measures military to military communication conflict prevention and uh, more effort on conflict resolution because i think as we heard already uh, as uh, from speakers speakers it's you know arms, arms buildup is the result of conflict so unless you do something about the conflict it will be difficult to reduce the risk of uh, escalation and, and and even up to nuclear conflict which would have global consequences so i will stop here and i'm ready to answer any questions thank you very much mark uh, you've started us off beautifully by giving us the reality check on what seems to be, uh, you know, uh, where we are going to put our focus on, uh, and also helping us uh, identify some of the bright spots. Uh, though I, uh, <laughs> we'll be literally scrounging the bottom of the barrel to look at those bright spots and to, you know, fish them out to feel good about some things going right when uh, so much else seems to be 
rather challenging right now. Uh, so that's a good thing. I um, have a couple of questions which I'll mark to you right away so that uh, you can think about them and then uh, perhaps uh, in one of the rounds of the questions we'll take them on. One is uh, you mentioned this integrated review of UK uh, where they have said that they're going to increase their numbers. So uh, what is your sense of why they are wanting to do this? What is the threat perception and uh, why suddenly has UK jumped into this whole thing about increasing numbers? And secondly, what do you think are some of the doctrinal issues uh, which are also increasing the challenges? You know, for instance, I have always felt that when the US nuclear posture review talks about uh, limited nuclear war or the use of low yield nuclear weapons, that becomes a problem. So I would like to have your sense of what the doctrinal challenges are. So now uh, moving on, uh, I would like to call upon Professor Swaran Singh, a very dear friend and uh, a colleague at IDSA when I started out on my career on these particular issues and I learned so much from him as a senior colleague. Uh, he's currently the chairperson of the Center for International Politics, Organization and Disarmament, School of International Studies, my alma mater as well for my PhD uh, at JNU, uh, and uh, very fond memories of the time that we've spent together. Uh, so I asked Professor Swaran Singh to look at the Non-Proliferation Treaty you know, as Mark just mentioned, uh, the treaty uh, review conference uh, is likely to be postponed to next year. It was supposed to happen last year to mark 50 years of the NPT. And it was supposed to be a big deal that we have the NPT for 50 years. And, you know, it was going to be a stock check on what the treaty was all about. Now, this will probably happen next year, uh, thanks to the pandemic and the struggle that all of us have been in. Uh, but uh, uh, Professor Swaran, if you could give us a sense of what do you think are going to be the challenges at the NPT Repcon whenever it takes place. Uh, we all have grown up understanding that the NPT stands on three legs. Uh, where do you see the state of those three legs? Which one is the most wobbly, you think? And uh, uh, what should we be looking out for when we are looking at the uh, forthcoming Repcon? So over to you. Thank you, Manpreet. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of this excellent panel. Thank you to Pramod and his uh, nice Nepal team. Uh, let me first uh, pinpoint the good news. Uh, I think until uh, 1919, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, disarmament was understood in human history as a victor disarming the vanquished. And it is in 1930s particularly that the debate came alive that that kind of disarmament had not worked and therefore equal, mutual and voluntary disarmament phase started which goes right away up to 1940s. 1960s onwards we moved from disarmament to arms control and we see the peak in the decade of 1970s when we have Detant and of course East and West begin to work together to achieve arms control and from there we have moved to non-proliferation which again can be linked as far back as to Canada era but then we had even moved to counter-proliferation from there so in that sense uh, a certain momentum has happened the way title says arms con uh, disarmament arms control and non-proliferation second uh, the good news is that uh, perhaps uh, the fact that uh, way back in 1962-63, President Kennedy uh, had warned the world that by 1975, we might end up having as many as 20 plus nuclear weapon states, that this whole effort at uh, NPT, which today defines the very central axis of non-proliferation order, uh, began to be negotiated. And as Manpreet just mentioned, it had three pillars, uh, which it was supposed to work upon non-proliferation being the most important first one the technical support and availability of uh, civil nuclear technologies to know those countries who decide not to become nuclear weapon states and of course finally disarmament which meant for the p5 for the permanent five or nuclear five states would in uh, their own good faith work on disarmament so uh, this is how it was conceived and i think one can notice clearly the first thing that not 20 even today the five NPT nuclear weapon states plus the four nuclear weapon states which are not defined as per NPT definition, nine states, not 20 states that were supposed to come up by uh, 1975. Uh, of course, there are many suspect states uh, which are still in conversation. 
Now, also in 1980s, for example, early 1990s, 1980s, about 70,000 plus nuclear warheads in the world have been reduced since then to about 14,000, which is an enormous reduction. Uh, not necessarily NPT has done it. It's bilateral largely between uh, Soviet Union, Russia, and the United States. But N NPT has created that whole, uh, whole uh, uh, ambience of uh, a whole lot of conventions, agreements, agencies, norms, and taboos which perhaps facilitated that enormous uh, one-fifth reduction. Uh, of course, even today, about 12,500 of these warrants continue to be between two states of Russia and the United States. So uh, enormous reduction is something which is significant to underline. And NPT does uh, uh, need to be credited for that very clearly. And NPT, which was on its 25th anniversary in 1995, was uh, extended indefinitely and unconditionally is seen by several nations as a universal law treaty and it has a 50th anniversary and as was said by Mark, uh, it became uh, 50 years in March 2020 and April of uh, last year was supposed to be RevCon, which has been postponed to January this year, then to August this year and maybe again to January next year. That also may be a good news in itself because just remember if it was to happen uh, in January of 2020 when uh, President Trump was in command, and his nuclear poster uh, review had clearly expanded the role of nuclear weapons, including several other threats, uh, including large conventional attacks or even uh, the tactical nuclear weapons or even cyber attacks. Uh, so that uh, perhaps is the good news that this got postponed in that sense. Uh, let me very quickly underline the two or three challenges that Repcon as and when it meets will have. Uh, everyone knows challenge will be clearly the aspirant JCPOA, uh, the controlled Iran, which uh, of course is also uh, signatory to IAEA and uh, additional protocol and other things. Uh, but you have now Ibrahim Raisi coming to power there. Uh, and I think that is going to perhaps change the ambience of how negotiations happen in Vienna. Five rounds have happened. One notices the reluctance of a certain level of European partners who in 2015 had been much more uh, excited. And second challenge clearly is North Korea which for 15 years has built up its own missiles and uh, nuclear stockpiles and it is a clearly nuclear weapon state. Uh, that this kind of uh, the, who will bring first is a continuous story between uh, United States since again President Donald Trump withdrew in 2018 and uh, from, the new, uh, from the Iran nuclear deal and now of course again uh, two summits with uh, Kim Jong-un had failed in uh, August, uh, February of 2018. And again, certain amount of uh, hope that some negotiations might begin again. But I think last point I want to underline is this including disaffection and divide between uh, non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear weapon states. And in January, when uh, the, the prohibition of nuclear weapons treaty was finally uh, came into force, that divide has become much more stronger. And I think nuclear uh, uh, NPT Revcon will have to deal with that divide, which has become very, very powerful divide now between non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear weapon states, which are opposed to uh, uh, this uh, uh, total ban on the nuclear weapons. In fact, uh, they are even saying that nuclear weapon states are saying that uh, TNW uh, that uh, that uh, uh, this treaty TPNW actually undermines NPT. So they are proposing it as a contradiction. Second fundamental. Uh, 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 the contradiction that need to be underlined is how over time NGOs and civil society has taken over global disarmament, arms control, non-proliferation. The last treaty signed by states in the conventional mechanism, which is con uh, Conference on Disarmament, was 1993 uh, uh, Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. Since then, starting with the anti-personal mine ban all the way to this uh, the current treaty of TPNW, it is NGOs and civil society which has taken the initiatives and taken lead in that direction. That really redefines the whole gamut of how uh, disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation will be understood, and how gradually the powerful states will be, you know, uh, sort of domesticated by power of the public opinion, and how much effort that will take. So, in that sense, NPT, which uh, stands at the center of this non-proliferation order, uh, is getting marginalized as other forces and their initiatives begin to take much greater center space in how the nuclear non-proliferation order will be defined in coming times. Uh, I look forward to any comments and questions, but I better stop there right now. Back to Manpreet. 
Thank you very much, Swaran. Again, an excellent expose on uh, what the NPT means in today's times, what the challenges are and what we can expect uh, whenever the review conference takes place. Um, uh, uh, you know, also I've been reading about how uh, people are beginning to redefine what would be success or failure of the NPT. And if there was no consensus document that comes out of the NPT because of this fissure that you spoke about, nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, uh, that should not be the benchmark on which we decide whether the NPT succeeded or not. Uh, so perhaps you can also dwell upon this a little bit, uh, you know, when we come to the question answer session about what you think are some of the criteria on which one would put a tick mark uh, of success against uh, uh, the NPT Repcon whenever that happens. Um, I don't see Professor Han Hua having joined us. Is she here yet? Was she listed for this uh, session? She was. Um, uh, I don't see that she's here. She, she's so, presently trying to join. Um, okay. she, she wrote to me, so hopefully she should be on be along shortly oh here she is i think oh, yeah i can see the perfect timing just admitting herself and so we'll just give her a few seconds to come in and settle down in fact while she does that frank in order to save time would it be okay if i call upon you uh, to take the floor yeah yeah, so okay. Dr. Frank O'Donnell uh, will be our next speaker while we are waiting for Ms. Hanhua to settle down. Ms. Hanhua, I'm glad you are finally here with us. But uh, uh, while it was your turn to speak, I'm going to pass it to Frank so that you can take a couple of minutes to settle yourself down uh, in the room. Uh, so Great. Dr. Frank Thank you so much. I'm so sorry no to be late. No problem. So Dr. Frank O'Donnell, um, is a non-resident fellow at the Stimson Center and uh, also a postdoctoral scholar at Tufts University. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, he's again another good friend with whom I've had several discussions on India's nuclear strategy. Both of us have, uh, well, lots of agreements, but some disagreements on how uh, the nuclear strategy and the capability buildup is perceived, but that's what scholars are meant for, to be able to do this back and forth on several issues. But as part of the panel today, um, Frank is going to look at uh, the recent uh, US-Russia summit, President Biden and Putin, when they came together just about a few days ago, um, and um, have tried to change the optics on non-proliferation disarmament uh, and arms control by suggesting that there is going to be a strategic stability dialogue uh, between US and Russia something that many of us have been calling for for a long time now in order to establish some kind of a framework uh, of dialogue uh, you know, back into fashion. So that's what the two presidents have promised uh, in this meeting. Uh, and uh, Frank is going to tell us uh, what does he expect from this? Uh, do you think it's actually going to change the picture? Uh, are the differences between US and Russia you know, so deep on many of these issues that they will find it difficult to uh, bridge the gap because both of them have a very different sense of what is actually threatening strategic stability. Uh, so Frank, please take us through your sense of what this summit was all about and what it will mean for arms control and uh, disarmament. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Pramod Jaiswal and nice for having me, to Manpreet for chairing this session and for that very kind invitation uh, to my fellow panelists and to the audience. I think we should have a great conversation. So as Manpreet said, my topic is the US-Russian nuclear relationship and in particular what might be possible in bilateral arms control and the strategic stability dialogue following the recent Biden-Putin summit. It is the case that despite the world of nuclear multipolarity in which we live, the world still does look to the US and Russia and the state of their bilateral arm control relationship for cues on how strategic stability might evolve. Although Biden is now in office, the White House interim national security strategic guidance of March 2021 was correct in saying, quote, we cannot pretend the world can simply be restored to the way it was 75, 30 or even four years ago, end quote. The INF is gone. The US and Russia have left the Open Skies Treaty. The phrase 
great power competition might not be mentioned as much under the new administration, but the basic framework of the US being engaged in a long-term strategic competition with China and Russia is still there, with perhaps greater emphasis on the possibility for carving out cooperation on elements of mutual interest under the Biden administration than under the Trump administration. The new Undersecretary for Defense, for, Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Colin Kyle, speaking to the Carnegie Nuclear Conference last Wednesday said, quote, the role that nuclear weapons plays in Russia's doctrine is quite elevated in the sense that I think Russia sees much higher utility for nuclear weapons than any other state, end quote. And so it's heartening to see that New START has been renewed, but we must also remember how close we came to its collapse and what that would have meant in terms of the last bilateral treaty limiting US-Russian nuclear competition falling and the arms race that would follow. It's also heartening that Biden and Putin in their joint summit reiterated the Gorbachev-Reagan statement that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. However, again, the fact that this is presented as a victory only highlights how far things have fallen and how much work is to be done. The level of technological complexity today adds another challenge. The US and Russia have historically not understood the technologies affecting, quote, strategic stability to be the same. The US is more interested in Russian tactical, medium, intermediate range nuclear weapons, while Russia wants to include ballistic missile defense and conventional precision guided munitions into that list of technologies affecting strategic stability. On top of this, we now have the entry of cyber capabilities and AI into this list as an empirical fact that has to be dealt with by both sides. For example, with that, we know the US has interfered with North Korean missile launches through cyber attacks on their command and control system from the most recent Bob Woodward book. Finally, as we live in this age of deepening nuclear multipolarity, we must also think of designing a framework that is not just realistic in terms of what can be achieved with US-Russia relations as they are, but which could easily be joined by other states, not least China. So I have two proposals which I hope the Strategic Civility Dialogue will focus on and which I think are realistic. The first is in terms of building trust and addressing the conventional and nuclear weapons which will come up in the dialogue, is to revive the old US-Russia Joint Data Exchange Center proposal which was going to be an information sharing hub for bilateral or third party missile launches. This revived center idea would in turn build upon the existing missile flight test pre-notification agreement between the US and Russia under New START. And it would build upon this by also incorporating and harmonizing those that have been agreed between India and Pakistan and China and Russia separately. So under this first member states would commit to pre-notify each other of any ballistic missile flight test, regardless of range, at least 72 hours before the commencement of the launch window. Similar notifications would be required for cruise missiles. And uh, thirdly, only one missile would be permitted to be launched per test window, which would help to curtail the scale of missile testing and including that on a scale that could be interpreted as uh, war preparations or nuclear war fighting. That's the first proposal. The second proposal comes from my colleague, Jacqueline Schneider from the Hoover Institution. Uh, and this proposal I feel has not got enough attention yet. This is for a cyber NFU agreement for, as she, in her own words, she quotes, cyber attacks that threaten the control of nuclear forces. These are cyber attacks that directly impede a nation's ability to launch or call back nuclear platforms, end quote. This is something that I feel will be of mutual interest between Russia and the US. I'll just uh, quickly post the link to that article for those interested in, into the chat for everybody to take a look at. And um, I am conscious of time, so I'll stop there. But I think those are two fairly realistic goals to aim for given where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, uh, I'm glad you put some concrete proposals on the table, uh, and they do look realistic. I, you know, I think I'm hopeful that uh, both of these uh, serve a mutual interest, and that they will be picked up as, uh, you know, looking at some of the shared risks and uh, addressing them. Uh, I was also hoping that you might be able to put uh, some kind of at least negotiations that get started on PNWs 
on the table. Uh, so my question to you when we open up would be, what do you, th what do you think are the chances of any kind of um, at least discussion beginning to happen on TNWs and whether they should be the next uh, target for any kind of arms control between these two countries? Um, so I'm so glad Ms. Hanhua is now here with us. Uh, she is a professor at Peking University, the School of International Studies. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, what we are, I think all of us are extremely interested in knowing is China's perspective on arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament. China has emerged uh, as such an important country in this field. Uh, the nuclear capability has uh, existed for a long time, but the kind of uh, progress that we are seeing, the expansion of capability uh, over the last, I would say, a decade now, uh, is certainly making China increase, uh, enhance its uh, nuclear profile. Uh, at the same time, China is one of the major countries which is not part of any arms control. Uh, and uh, uh, there has been so much hope uh, that along with the, along with US and Russia, that China would also begin to play uh, uh, you know, show up its responsibility as a participant in arms control. Uh, but the voices that we hear essentially from China are that we are not interested in it till the other two countries come down to our level in terms of numbers. So Ms. Hanwa, if you could give us your sense of what is China's perspective on all of these issues. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to really uh, express my apology <laughs> to everyone. Uh, uh, I'm quite late, uh, but uh, I'm very glad and honored to be part of this uh, exercise and uh, show some uh, my personal um, thoughts on the Chinese perspective on the current uh, uh, disarmament and non-proliferation. Um, as I said, uh, just said uh, maybe maybe uh, everyone is looking at China because uh, China um, still uh, in the path of uh, rising and maybe uh, he's uh, working on the um, nuclear modernization uh, and other, other uh, I mean, engagement uh, on the nuclear uh, arsenal. Um, but let, let me give my um, perspective on the current uh, uh, disarmament um, practice. Uh, for me, I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic uh, about uh, the um, pros uh, cost of this uh, uh, nuclear disarmament. I have uh, three reasons to say that. The first one is um, they, they are, uh, as the pre-war um, pre uh, speaker just uh, outlined, the uh, arms control or disarmament uh, institutions or regimes are not uh, working well. well. Uh, um, as everybody uh, knows well, uh, the only uh, institution or regime for great power uh, arms control and disarmament is a start treaty. Uh, fortunately, um, the Trump, no, Biden administration uh, just announced uh, maybe postpone, postpones uh, of the START treaty rather than to uh, give up. Um, so we still have uh, maybe five, uh, some years to have a kind of a framework for the two uh, nuclear established power to really restrain um, their engagement in the nuclear um, nuclear capability engagement. Um, but they, they have uh, seen um, Trump administration's uh, withdrawal uh, withdrawals uh, of um, quite a few of arms control um, regimes, uh, including uh, ABM treaty, uh, sorry, um, and that INF treaty and those also Open Sky treaty. So all these uh, uh, withdrawal uh, really damaged 
the overall uh, the pillars of the arms controls and disarmament. Uh, the second reason I um, I think is not uh, good for the further uh, nuclear disarmament is as uh, Trump administration's uh, national security uh, strategy outlined. Nowadays, uh, it's a great power competition or rivalry. The age is no longer uh, anti-terrorism or others. It's uh, just a, a rivalry between great powers. What does that mean to uh, to China? Maybe uh, it's for me at least. Uh, it means uh, a few uh, points. The first one is now the nuclear competitions is coming back. Um, if we look at uh, Obama's administration's uh, NPR, we can say uh, the shrinking of the nuclear role in the overall uh, US national uh, security uh, strategy. But con uh, conventional weaponry uh, is getting more important. But uh, if we look at uh, Trump's administration's uh, uh, strategy, they say the nuclear uh, nuclear limit war. That kind of uh, concept is coming back. Um, we haven't seen the NPR under Biden administration. Maybe next year we will we'll see that. But uh, we still get the balance of a uh, conventional and nuclear uh, development is a uh, really uh, reversed um, trend. So uh, we, we have seen so many people talking about uh, the nuclear limit war rather than uh, conventional war. The second point, uh, the great competition is uh, new technologies, the competition of new technologies. When we talk about the strategic stability, we no longer talk about the nuclear per se, uh, the, the, the deterrence, but um, we have to take all the uh, new technologies in our uh, consideration. For example, the AR or um, the, the, the hypersonic weapons or others. So all these uh, technologies really uh, getting kind of uh, um, trendy uh, among the great powers uh, engagement in their perspect uh, perspective uh, um, the progress. Um, and the the third point uh, is for me it's hard to. Uh, to predict a, a kind of a momentum in disarmament is that uh, the Sino-American relations. Uh, now they are confronting a kind of a more um, more hoggish uh, 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 diplomacy or the policy uh, under Trump and the Biden administrations. And also they have, uh, um, say, uh, unprecedented uh, the notion uh, of China in their, um, the US uh, national security strategy. Uh, as Biden administration uh, described uh, China as the most uh, Serious uh, national, um, I mean, threat. Uh, so that that means um, something really we um, haven't seen that before. So among the Chinese uh, arms controllers or national um, security analysts, it is um, very new and very precedent. Uh, um, the, the notion. So what does that mean? Uh, we have seen some some uh, uh, actions taken, for example, uh, 
the Taiwan across Taiwan Street, the situation is uh, intensified, and the South China Sea will also see some um, some kind of armament uh, in this very flashpoint. Uh, that that means some discussions among the Chinese analysts. Uh, what we can do to prevent some kind of uh, uh, flash points uh, getting out of there, those uh, scenarios. Uh, but the first one, uh, it, not, not the first one, but one of the key uh, responses for some Chinese uh, arms controllers, all the national uh, security analysts, um, as some people have already noticed that uh, the nuclear uh, nuclear weapons. They have to strengthen uh, strength our uh, nuclear deterrent. As Hu Xijin, the Global Time editor, former uh, editor, he just uh, proposed a kind of a quick uh, increase of the nuclear arsenals, especially the ICBMs. Uh, that uh, provoke uh, some discussion, or some people uh, oppose that idea. So the debate still going on, but they still can say from this uh, discussion or the debate, they can say some kind of uh, um, mentality uh, is get getting uh, the 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 nuclear topic back in the central stage. Uh, what, what does that mean, uh, the increase of the, uh, the nuclear arsenal in China? Uh, I think uh, as the uh, 2020, uh, 2020 uh, the national uh, DOD's, uh, US DOD's uh, China military power just outlined um so far we still say the chinese uh, nuclear arsenal uh, keeps very small low as the the, the original version is a uh, low of tw uh, 2000 uh, no sorry uh, 200 um, but uh, they predict uh, in uh, a decade also the arsenal will be doubled I, I cannot say for sure it will happen. It uh, pretty much depends on the relationship between uh, US and China. And uh, if this, um, I mean, confrontation between these two countries uh, in further intensified, I, I still cannot say uh, some kind of uh, very strong uh, argument for the um, arms control in terms of uh, Chinese uh, nuclear arsenal. I, I hope uh, we can really decrease the number of that we need to decrease the role of the nuclear weapons in the Chinese uh, overall national strategy. But I haven't seen um, some good uh, signs uh, or some good environments uh, for that di uh, direction. That's my concern. As an uh, arms controller uh, in, in China, I still think uh, the arms control should be uh, the, the mo get momentum uh, among the scholars and uh, uh, analysts. Uh, I still hope someday uh, China should, uh, can, uh, participate the the arms control talks uh, with uh, the United States and Russia, but as Sadie just uh, said, uh, China is is outside of any arms control regimes. But I don't agree with uh, you uh, on that point because uh, China's. Uh, has uh, been very active uh, participating in um, P5 uh, framework under the UN arms control uh, framework. So in that sense, uh, I, I hope uh, everything 
especially when we talk about uh, nuclear disarmament, we can still see the momentum of disarmament uh, is getting more trendy than now. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, uh, excellent uh, perspective from the Chinese side on uh, their sense of what uh, uh, these issues are all about. I think uh, uh, very correctly, you, uh, you know, you've put it in the construct of the political relationship between US and China, which will be the driver for the kind of uh, uh, arms buildup uh, on the nuclear front that we see in China. Um, the debates that you've mentioned on the nuclear numbers, uh, on NFU, uh, I think also on no first use, there has been an incipient debate as it often happens in many countries, including in India. And also, uh, I have come across some writings on whether China should uh, revise, with, with the early warning systems coming into play, whether China should revise its launch on warning or launch under attack kind of postures. So during the question and answer session, if you could dwell a little bit on some of these debates that one hears and what that would mean for the posture. Now, while you mentioned the US DOD report saying that the numbers are in low 200s, uh, a recent CIPRI report actually has said that the numbers in the case of China, that's the largest increase amongst all the nuclear possessors, nuclear weapon possessor states, and the numbers have gone up from 320 to 350, according to the latest CIPRI report, which just came out uh, you know, a, a week ago. Uh, so perhaps that is also something that you would like to look at. Um, uh, I don't see Dr. Sanya having joined us. I, Sanya, are you there? I don't see Sanya is here. Uh, so while we will, still keep our doors open uh, in case uh, she joins a little later. But let me now call upon Dr. Sita Kant Mishra, uh, a colleague of mine at CAPS uh, for many years before he moved on to the uh, university, the uh, Pandit Deen Dayal Petroleum University in Gandhinagar in, in India, uh, where he's an associate professor now and uh, uh, doing a great job in terms of setting up uh, a lot of um, lectures on these particular issues. Uh, so Sita Kant has uh, offered to look at the Indian perspective on uh, all of these issues. And uh, uh, like China, uh, India has also had a rather unique perspective towards nuclear weapons. Having seen how the Cold War panned out and what nuclear weapons were really meaningful for, uh, India decided to have a doctrine which actually starts by a desire for a nuclear disarmed world uh, and it ends with the same aspiration. But there are many people who have suggested that is India, um, you know, traveling in two boats uh, by having nuclear weapons and yet arguing for disarmament. So Sita Kant, it'll be nice if you could, uh, you know, sort of unpack this whole debate for us and tell us about India's perspective. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam. Am I audible? Okay. So um, um, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, my um, co-panelists. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely thank uh, Nice Nepal and uh, Dr. Jaiswal and his team for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts um, on particularly India's perspective on nuclear disarmament, arms control, and on proliferation. If time permits, then I'll definitely dwell upon the triangular relationship or strategic chain that is unfolding in Southern Asia as well. But the fundamental question, as uh, Madam Chair has highlighted actually, that whether India's tryst with global non-proliferation arms control and disarmament regime is unswerving or checkered. There is divergence of opinion as Madam has pointed out. But let me uh, highlight the fact that uh, while discussing about India's perspective on nuclear disarmament and all these issues, one needs to understand the uniqueness of India's nuclear discourse. And particularly when we are talking about uh, you know, non-proliferation and disarmament, I think the first unique that, that attracts everybody's mind is India started with its nuclear energy program, uh, unlikely all other nuclear weapon states, those who started with nuclear weapons program and then switched to or added the nuclear energy program. In case of India, it is India who started with a civilian objective, peaceful use of nuclear energy, and then at certain point, because of the strategic compulsion, it had to think about nuclear weapons. So that is what one major you know, uh, parameter that I would like to uh, you know, draw your attention. And from then on, I will take forward 
uh, the discussion. Obviously, because of the paucity of time, I'm not looking into the history part. But yes, India's independence coincided with the dawn of the global nuclear era. So India has, from the very beginning itself, part and parcel of the global nuclear discourse. 1940s and 50s, you see, uh, in almost Indian, uh, you know, leaders are a kind of inbuilt revulsion uh, against nuclear weapons. Nehru, Gandhi, and whatever you subsequent leaders. So you find throughout the 40s and 50s. Uh, you know, India's clarion called for nuclear disarmament, non non proliferation. 60s, 70s, you find a turning point in India's approach, and turning point largely because of the Chinese behavior, Chinese nuclear test, and, uh, and prior to India China uh, debacle, and then 64 onwards, Chinese nuclear test, and then thermonuclear test followed, and then you find India's uh, concerns about the NPT, and India finally had to reject that. Uh, the trend during 1980s continued in similar way, and the most, uh, you know, the genith of India's clarion call for nuclear disarmament, I think, uh, can be referred to Rajiv Gandhi Action Plan of 1988, when uh, he proposed that the world can go for nuclear disarmament in a phased manner, and had it had the world listened to him, probably we would have been finishing the nuclear, uh, you know, arsenals by 2010. So this is the short history that I could deal with. Uh, there are many more we can focus later on if time permits, but let me take you to the late 1990s when India crossed the Rubicon, uh, tested the second round of nuclear tests, declared itself a nuclear weapon state, and then formulated a year later the nuclear doctrine, which was drafted. And then in 2003, India operationalized the nuclear doctrine. And particularly in that doctrine, of course, it is a nuclear use doctrine, but the first uh, you know, page itself highlights nuclear disarmament objectives of India. And in, in the first paragraph itself, it says global verifiable and non-discriminatory nuclear disarmament is national security objective. And India shall continue its efforts to achieve the global, the goal of nuclear weapons free world at an early date. And since no first use of nuclear weapons is India's basic commitment, efforts shall be made to persuade other states to join an international treaty banning the first use of nuclear weapons. And this is what, ladies and gentlemen, India's nuclear doctrine says at the first instance. So from there on, if you look at what transition have taken place after India declared itself as a nuclear weapon state, what are the uh, basic transitions have taken place? I think, uh, you know, C. Rajamon has written a fantastic uh, literature on this, where he points out there are three transitions at the best. Number one, there is a shift from the past emphasis on disarmament to a new one on the pragmatic arms control. So there is a visible change in India's attitude towards nuclear uh, disarmament arms control. Uh, because he says that the former, uh, the nuclear disarmament particularly talks about abolition of nuclear weapons. The later, that means the arms control talks about, uh, you know, the challenge of reducing the nuclear threat in the short term. So, so nuclear disarmament, therefore, from India's point of view, had two parts. One is the long-term goal and the short-term goal. Uh, the second point uh, of transition is there seems to be priority given um, or shift from a goal of time-bound elimination of nuclear weapons to the pursuit of a less ambitious and more limited agenda of global nuclear restraint, um, where he says that total disarmament as a long-term normative goal India still keeps it and at the same time India thinks about an arms control or adjusting itself to the global non-proliferation regime as well. The third transition that is visible in India point of view is the emphasis uh, on practical steps to deal with the danger of nuclear weapons. Of late India has realized that the challenges of maintaining nuclear weapons not only within also in the neighborhood and therefore, India's enthusiastic participation in nuclear strategy, uh, nuclear security summits, all the four summits, India has been a strategic, uh, has been an enthusiastic partner and offered a lot more. And even uh, if I take the discussion a little further, India has also negotiated with uh, with Pakistan about the safety of nuclear weapons, and if there is a disaster, they can collaborate as well. So there are uh, you know one or two nuclear CBMs that are in, perfectly in operation. Now, if you look at the other side of the picture, what India is talking about after the, become declaring itself a nuclear weapon state, it has a new bargain. And the bargain is that, okay, there is a unilateral morali moratorium on further nuclear test. India has assured the world that I'm not going to test further. 
and at the same time india is trying to you know, accommodate itself in the in the in the in the, in the uh, uh, international system or nuclear international system as well in the sense what i'm saying is actually india is trying to be a partner with the uh, uh, mtcr wasner arrangement australia group it is aspiring to become a member of the nsg uh, so it is it, at the domestic level it has been uh, it as aligning uh, its domestic laws with the international standards so a lot more things india has tried to adjust itself to the uh, global norms this is actually in fact a welcome step probably if nsg comes up in a better way and india's aspiration is uh, decided probably it will contribute in in lot more ways uh, what is the uniqueness further in India's approach to the disarmament? And this is a little bit I will focus and then I'll wind it up. The first thing that what India is emphasizing uh, is about a global no first use treaty. And here is a philosophical divide between India's approach to disarmament and the rest of the world approach to disarmament. Even the ban treaty, which is uh, based on one philosophical argument that yes, at one go, we can ban the nuclear weapons, we can disarm. Whereas India's approach is a step-by-step -step approach where it says that let's first uh, declare a no first use treaty or agree to no, not to use nuclear weapons at first. And then probably it will lead to a kind of eventual elimination of nuclear weapons in the long term. And this is not a just a clarion call in a hollow call, rather uh, what India is referring to the, 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 the chemical weapons convention of 1993. If you look at Chemical Weapon Convention, the process that it started uh, way back in 1925, uh, the, in 1925, which is called the Geneva Protocol, uh, which was signed uh, among uh, the, the like-minded countries not to first use chemical weapons. And then from 1925, uh, 68 years ahead, 1993, finally the Chemical Weapons Convention came into being and uh, chemical weapons have been banned. Even in between, from 1925 to 1993, a lot of other countries have used chemical weapons, but it was realized at one point that chemical weapons are useless. It's not going to change the battle alignment and therefore uh, better not to use it. So this is a lesson probably the non proliferation or the, or the nuclear disarmament regime can draw from the chemical weapons convention. And here is India's argument. Uh, uh, you know, it says that Yes, at one point we can think about no first use of nuclear weapons as an immediate goal and it will lead eventually to nuclear disarmament the longer term, but it should, it should follow by a realization world over that nuclear war cannot be fought to win a meaningful victory and then only countries will discard nuclear weapons. Till now, till the ban treaty, there was no other regime, there was no consideration to establish the fact that nuclear weapons are Political weapons, they're not for war fighting. Yes, the ban treaty has uh, seemed to have created a kind of new discourse. And, uh, but on the philosophical uh, understanding that at one go nuclear weapons can be disarmed, uh, where India is not really uh, you know, uh, conformed to. And therefore India's argument when it uh, very, very closely observed the ban treaty, it says that um, uh, India is not convinced because the conference would address the longstanding uh, would address the long-standing expectation of the international community for a comprehensive instrument on nuclear disarmament. And India therefore boycotted the ban treaty. Uh, at the same time, India rather advocated that why not such kind of treaty can be negotiated in the UN platform that is Conference on Disarmament, which is a dedicated platform. So any uh, nuclear disarmament initiative outside the UN uh, you know, process is really not uh, acceptable to India. So this is the philosophical divide between uh, the world and rest, uh, India and the rest, uh, uh, rest of the world when it comes to nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. Uh, the last part that a few minutes that I will highlight on the security trilemma that is unfolding in South Asia. Uh, yes, if you look at South Asia, the three countries are entangled by now. Of course, somebody can tell also there is a point lemma. That means uh, Russia and uh, America can be brought into this uh, discourse as well. But in Southern Asia, what is happening, and there is a lot of expectation, can we think uh, you know, coherently now, three countries are entangled some with the other. But I'm a little bit skeptical the way I think Dr. Han Hua pointed out. Uh, there is a doctrinal asymmetry, not between China and India, 
but between uh, uh, India and uh, Pakistan, when in India, uh, India and China both have adopted no first use policy, uh, you can question the rationality. But in any case, uh, Pakistan is having a completely different force posture or, or nuclear use posture. So the asymmetry in strategic capability is also a factor. Uh, China, Pakistan, and India, there is a very less symmetry when it comes to their force posture. So the chances of bringing them to one platform and negotiating for a kind of thing is very, very uh, bleak, very, very small. But yes, not only the nuclear weapons that are complicating the Southern Asia's uh, strategic domain, there are some non-nuclear systems that are in progress, actually, what uh, Dr. Han Hua has also pointed out about uh, the, uh, the, the new uh, technological advancement that has taken place, not only only in nuclear domain, rather in missile defense, the MIRVs, cruise missiles, long-term, long-range long, long range cruise missiles, anti-satellite weapons. Uh, there are conventional counterforce like precision strike arms and then cyber warfare. These are all complicating the nuclear domain as well. So I'm a little bit sanguine about, or I'm, I'm really skeptical whether all the three countries will come to a common platform and go for a kind of trilateral negotiation. But yes, the hope is that when the, the iron is hot, probably it can be stretched. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sita Khan. That's a lot you've put on the table here. Uh, and I am hoping that some of the other panelists will also pick up uh, some of those points. Uh, so um, we are um, expecting a lot of questions now that all our panelists have spoken. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Sanya is not able to join us. Uh, uh, but uh, we still have a lot here uh, to discuss. So what I propose to do is, while we are still waiting for more questions to come, I can see in the chat box that there are some which are already there, and I will post them to the, uh, you know, to the uh, panelists that they have uh, sought answers from. But to start with, if I can uh, get the panelists to come back with their thoughts on some of the questions that I posed to you uh, just after you had spoken. Uh, so just take about a minute or two to try and respond to those. And in case you would like to ask uh, or pick up any point that somebody else has spoken about and would like to have, uh, you know, a comment of your own on that. Uh, so can I start with you, Mark, and uh, uh, go down in the same order as we did in the past? Yes, thank you, uh, Manfred. Uh, yes, you asked about the UK increase uh, with uh, nuclear arsenal of course, which has been uh, very criticized uh, within the UK and, and the arms control community in general. Uh, it's, well, you did mention the threat perceptions. Obviously, it's, it's related to the behavior of Russia, mostly uh, maybe China to some extent, the risk of uh, you know, cyber attacks, uh, new technologies, etc. But it's, of course, from a military strategic point of view, it doesn't make sense to increase you know, by a dozen nuclear weapons, uh, comp especially comparing to the, the huge redundancy that already exists. Uh, and the second point is that it doesn't make sense also in, in terms of non-proliferation, because then it will um, make uh, difficult, if not impossible, um, to criticize um, those who are also increasing their stockpiles, like, like China, as we've seen, and, uh, you know, uh, even uh, course, North Korea. So uh, it's, it's been called actually a blow to the, uh, you know, the non-proliferation uh, process. The second question you ask is about uh, doctrines. And it's true that, uh, you know, we are in the middle of a potential revision of the U.S. military doctrine. We expect a nuclear posture review by uh, the Biden administration. I'm sure Frank can, can uh, know more about that. Um, and, and there has been a lot of uh, speculation about whether this will include, include moving towards or close to no first use. We know that Biden has been supportive of this approach uh, uh, during the Obama administration, that there was resistance within the U.S. Um, security apparatus, uh, but also uh, among allies. Uh, but if this is the case, uh, and, and I'm sure this has been raised during recent consultations between U.S. and allies, um, this will be a major uh, development. Uh, of course, it will put pressure on the other nuclear weapon states to follow suit. And if um, 
uh, actually we could come closer to the uh, the goal of in India's uh, security policy as just outlined, uh, it will have, of course, it can play a, a major effect on, you know, pressure to delegitimize or reduce the salience of nuclear weapons in uh, security policies. Um, and so uh, obviously uh, now we see this uh, risk of use, increased risk of use of nuclear weapons, very closely related both to um, cho technological choices, choices of new categories of weapons like uh, low yield uh, uh, nuclear weapons or uh, even hypersonic missiles, which are designed to bypass the missile defense systems, uh, and uh, also due to uh, these um, doctrinal evolutions, uh, where you know, countries like Pakistan, as we know, you know, in include uh, possible recourse to nuclear weapons uh, as a first strike. In, in a conventional conflict. So if there was uh, a common understanding that the best way to reduce this risk of nuclear war is to start with no first use, which will help then uh, reduce arsenals, then uh, I think that would be a major uh, advance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, makes a lot of sense. I think uh, many of us are hopeful that the nuclear posture review will turn the you know, turn the direction uh, from what uh, the previous posture review had spoken about. Uh, many of us would want the NFU to figure in there uh, because that would really make a difference. Uh, but I don't think any of us should be holding our breath on that. But perhaps Frank will have something to tell us more about where you think the posture review uh, could be taking us. But Swaran, can I come back to you and uh, get you to comment on a little bit more on the NPT uh, metric of success? Or failure. Thank you, Manpreet. Six minutes was a really short time for a professor who usually takes 40 minutes to make his first point. But let me now say something on the success of NPT, which I described to be the very center of non proliferation order. And in that sense, it has been fairly successful in containing the proliferation. Uh, definitely the, the horizontal proliferation uh, and to some extent also vertical proliferation. I think the difficulty lies in other two pillars uh, where uh, dispersal of uh, civilian technologies, uh, the promise that was handed out to non-nuclear states, uh, that has not been affected. In fact, increasingly proliferation has encourage initiatives in denying those technologies to uh, non-nuclear weapon states. And likewise, the third pillar of, in good faith, the nuclear five nations will pursue disarmament. Uh, all uh, arms control that has happened is only between the two big sheriffs, uh, Moscow and Washington, DC. Only once I remember, perhaps in 2008 or sometime, uh, President Obama had initiated a, a P5 meeting on the subject of exploring the summit. Uh, so in case they have to really uh, sort of uh, build up the trust of uh, a larger community of non-nuclear non -nuclear weapon states in NPT, which is dissipating, as I just mentioned very clearly, because of the uh, TPNW now becoming a reality and showcasing that gulf. Uh, I think the N5 must begin to uh, talk about uh, disarmament, uh, collective multilateral disarmament among the P5. And of course, there are uh, countries like China that always will say that until 90% of their arsenals are uh, removed, we will not be even negotiating on these issues. Uh, but that is where I think that uh, reinforcement of trust in NPT in, uh, needs to be brought about. Like I mentioned in last uh, 20, 25 years, uh, it is the NGO, civil society, no laureates, retired foreign ministers and others uh, who have become uh, a force unto themselves in molding uh, norm and directives of uh, disarmament and arms control, uh, how they can also be, you know, obtaining a greater space and voice uh, in uh, Redcon meetings of NPT and other uh, possibilities of providing them space in that sense. I think. I think the final point to me is, uh, let me put my neck out and say, 
uh, is uh, the it is in best interest of uh, the United States today uh, to uh, delegitimize nuclear weapons. You remember the whole debate of four horses had started some time ago, but it has dissipated because again the, the role of nuclear weapons was expanded during uh, Trump era. But it is in the best interest of United States because you notice if a small country like North Korea develops nuclear weapons, and then you see President Donald Trump who hates traveling coming twice all the way to Asia to talk to Kim Jong-un and, uh, and fall in love with him, as he said. Uh, and, and that compulsion is underlining how uh, if we continue to treat uh, nuclear weapons as currency of power, the United States becomes extremely weak and vulnerable state and is not able to use because taboo, I think another success of NPT is this enormous norm and taboo, non-possession, non-use uh, taboo, which is built and I think it's universal today. Uh, is where the need for delegitimizing nuclear weapons is very significant. It's a national interest of United States to lead that campaign because relatively uh, launching uh, unconventional wars or conventional wars uh, is relatively the, the, the kind of uh, norm today. You see United States going out and, you know, uh, creating mess uh, wherever they go, of course, but, you know, at least showcasing that prowess, uh, even if they create a bigger mess than what was before they entered a particular theater. One after another, after Second World War, look at any intervention of the United States, it's a mess. But that's a good mess because it serves domestic constituencies in, in the United States. It definitely serves their military industrial complex that supplies weapons to both the terrorists and armed forces who keep fighting between themselves. That perhaps will be a better boost to American economy, even how, however crudely we look at it to delegitimize uh, nuclear weapons and that perhaps would help us make NPT finally universal. You heard recently Imran Khan saying if Kashmir is resolved then he doesn't see any role for nuclear weapons. So a country like Pakistan uh, is possibly contemplating you know that nuclear weapons can perhaps be you know, sort of uh, eliminated potentially. So I think that is how we can revert back from counter proliferation back to non proliferation back to arms control and go back to original goal of general and complete disarmament, at least in case of nuclear weapons. So NPT perhaps then go down the history in that sense as a universal norm. Uh, but until that is achieved, you will continuously have very important nations like Israel, North Korea, India, Pakistan, and other aspiring nations, uh, which will continue to stay out of NPT and NPT will never be able to accommodate them. Uh, so in that sense, I think it lies, the key lies today that uh, the United States should take, to, should take a lead of co-opting civil society, of delegitimizing nuclear weapons and eliminating them, uh, and of course uh, making sure that uh, somehow uh, they are able to take uh, non-nuclear weapon states into confidence by A, agreeing to uh, the TPNW and also initiating a general multilateral uh, disarmament negotiations at the level of N5 in UN Security Council. So there is a lot that NPT has achieved, but I think it is eroding its shine over a period of time and the centrality of the narrative is moving somewhere else. And if an NPT has to be uh, secured and protected to go down in history as having played a central role uh, in nuclear non-proliferation, uh, I think these kind of initiatives will have to come upon and obviously the hope lies that the United States will take that initiative because even if we keep presenting Rajiv Gandhi action plans in UN, UN General Assembly, uh, they are good for domestic constituencies. They make no difference at international narrative. Uh, so only when the United States will take some serious bold initiatives, maybe something can happen. So NPT needs to be rescued at this stage. Otherwise, it is going to fall off the cliff. Manpreet. Thank you very much, Swaran. Again, uh, excellent intervention. and. Uh, well, you started by saying that as a professor, it uh, you know it takes almost an hour to warm up <laughs> before you get to the main points. But I think you've not, despite becoming a professor, you've not lost your academic touch where you can just get to the point uh, as quickly as is needed. Uh, uh, also, your point about uh, the U.S. taking the lead in delegitimizing nuclear weapons. While the argument is well taken, and we've all been making it for a long time. Because the US really sets the fashion on the nuclear street, I think. Everybody follows when they do something. Uh, but the problem now is that the others have begun to see so much sense in having those nuclear weapons. As uh, Ms. Hanwa had pointed out, 
you know, the Obama nuclear posture review, for instance, was flaunting its conventional capability to say that because we've got this capability, we can afford to get away from nuclear. But that doesn't apply to everybody. So unless I think uh, uh, President Biden is able to make the nuclear risk a shared risk, where everybody feels that there is a risk by having nuclear weapons. And uh, really, I mean, the difficult part is going to be how does that sense of uh, commonality of interest filter into everybody? And here I'm talking about the nine nuclear armed states, not just within the NPT, because you, know, you can't have the four hanging out with their nuclear weapons uh, if the five are going to do something within the NPT. So somewhere we have to bring the nine together and the shared uh, uh, value of uh, the risks has to be understood by everyone for us to really move in the direction of disarmament. And I'm hopeful that uh, President Biden, giving, given his personal conviction on many of these issues, perhaps will be the force that uh, the world was waiting for. Uh, but let me turn to Frank now. And uh, if you'd like to sort of answer some of those questions that I've raised earlier and pick up on anything else that you think is worthy. Sure. Uh, if it's OK with you, Ma'am Preet, I'll take the one you've been talking about, about uh, Biden and no first use for going on to your question on uh, tactical nuclear weapons between US and Russia. Is that OK in that order? OK, so um, the Biden administration and uh, and the nuclear posture review and, and the prospect of um, that leading to a US no first use commitment I, I talked earlier about the U.S. Undersecretary of Defense, Colin Cowles, remarks, and until we get anything further, I'm just posting it in the chat there. You can see it. Uh, this um, he gave this Wednesday public remarks. I think they start from page two, and it gives a good sense as to what the current administration thinking is. And he, one thing I want to point out is that he says that I, I'm. He says that. Uh, we have to ask ourselves in the US hard questions about whether us showing unilateral restraint would lead to reciprocal restraint on the other side. And I don't see a lot of evidence with that right now. And I think we can take that to partly apply to no to the question of no first use, but then um, you know, other parts of the where nuclear US nuclear doctrine and posture is going. Um, that if the US were to come out with a no first use declaration. Um, they'd be kind of accepting a, definitely a high domestic political cost for that without any, I think, any real confidence that that would be met by um, Russia in particular. So I, I my, that's reason one where I would like to see it happen, but I, I am kind of skeptical about that. And just the broader context that I think I spoke about and I think has been an, an, under, an undercurrent, a theme here is that um, the there's the great power competition idea with russia and china is a lot more intense now uh than the last time that the us was discussing this um under the obama administration by then uh during that time you know um you know around 2010 2011 the strategic environment nuclear environment looked relatively benign compared to now you could argue at least from the perspective we have in the us the second reason why i'm doubtful about NFU coming out on under the Biden administration is something that I think has been touched upon a little bit here so far, but not enough, I think, is uh, the problem for the US is uh, extended deterrence. And when the Obama administration did take a close look at NFU, it did deeply discuss this and internally, but also externally with its allies. And when explaining, you know, why it ended up not um, not declaring an NFU commitment. Um, officials said that, you know, multiple officials said that the when we were going through this process, the strongest, the most robust opposition to this came from Japan and South Korea as our allies, as um, beneficiaries of extended deterrence that this will weaken our national defense and this will weaken our confidence in the US as a treaty ally. So that's that's a problem that you know the U.S. has to deal with, and that you know we can talk about how can you um, delegitimize nuclear weapons, how can you move toward disarmament while still um, keeping in place a non-nuclear Germany, a non-nuclear Japan, non-nuclear South Korea, and so on and so forth. 
I would like to see it happen. I think it's, it's logical, but as I say, there, there's a lot of um, some political, some strategic reasons why I think it's, I'm skeptical that that would come out under this administration at this time. Uh, Manpreet asked an excellent question to me about um, the prospect of a tactical nuclear weapon ban or a cap or discussions on this uh, between the US and Russia as part of the bilateral arms control talks. Uh, and my, my answer, again, is slightly skeptical is I don't really think that's uh, foreseeable right now. Uh, perhaps later on as, you know, more trust is built in the relationship, but, but that, I think that's fairly ambitious right now. When I mentioned both my proposals of the, the flight test pre-notification agreement and the cyber NFU agreement, um, these are both strategic stability measures, but they're kind of more in terms of trust building, uh, transparency, risk reduction, uh, than say concrete weapons, caps, or bans. Um, a tactical nuclear weapon cap or ban, again, I would love to see it happen, uh, but the a challenge is it'd be difficult to enact without, of course, strong verification mechanisms. Strong verification mechanisms in turn uh, would require a treaty um, to happen, and that treaty would have to go before the United States Senate, uh, which is, as you know, um, going back a long time you know to the ctbt but just with regarding anything at all happening these days it's it would be dead in the water um so both of my proposals uh, by comparison can be agreed at the presidential level rather than through treaties and i also don't think it's controversial to say that if new that i don't think it's controversial to say that we wouldn't still have the new start would not have been renewed if it had to go through senate ratification again um, instead, I mean, there's fortunately a provision in the New START treaty that enables the president, that enables Biden to extend the treaty um, while claiming that he's simply extending a treaty that had already been approved by the Senate back in 2010. If New START renewal extension had to go back before the Senate again, again, I don't think it's controversial to say that it, it simply wouldn't have happened. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and I look forward to further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, while I was uh, hopeful that the answer would be yes, but yes, I uh, understand the realism that you're bringing into the whole picture with both the NFU and the TNW. Uh, the real picture really looks far more difficult than what our wish list seems to be at this moment. Uh, Ms. Hanhua, uh, would you like to come in now? Uh, yes. Uh, could I just uh, follow uh, what uh, Frank just uh, talked about uh, the no force use uh, statement or question? I uh, remember uh, when Obama came into office and his team uh, prepared for the non, uh, nuclear posture review. Uh, I think that episode really show uh, how the resistance uh, strongly affect uh, the final version of the uh, the NPR of the government. Uh, actually, the allies, maybe especially Japan, uh, was opposed to the uh, aspir any expression in the uh, document uh, showing the sole purpose. Maybe it's not uh, uh, the word of uh, the no first use, but so purpose uh, was proposed actually to the Obama administration, but uh, it turned out to be uh, failed. So from that uh, uh, story or the episode, I can see how uh, I, I also uh, a little bit the spectacle about uh, the so purpose will uh, coming out of the, the document and uh, by the administration, even some the, the Chinese uh, uh, arms control uh, circle. I mean, they discuss, some people talk about uh, maybe they were going to be that kind of expression, but I'm still spectacle uh, of that. And also, uh, I, I think, um, Something uh, coming out of the the Biden Putin summit meeting, uh, even it, it was not a very successful uh, meeting or summit meeting, 
but uh, one uh, one sign or signal coming out of the summit meeting is the the not, not John's statement, but uh, uh, Americans' uh, uh, statement out of the the summit meeting. One point showed uh, uh, the U.S. and Russia uh, expressed their uh, their willingness to accept the the strategic stability between between them. So I, I think that that's uh, a good sign, uh, and also um, something maybe will come out of the Biden's NPR or nuclear posture. Uh, that that's uh, really showing uh, may, maybe under Biden administration, U.S. Uh, is willing to accept that concept uh, rather than Trump's. Um, is talking about uh, the nuclear war or some kind of technical nuclear weapons or low yield uh, nuclear weapons usage in the war fighting scenario. So that 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 make makes me feel. Uh, I mean, <laughs> wow. Uh, that that's one one point I want to say. Uh, the other is just as Seti just mentioned about the Chinese uh, changing po nuclear posture, maybe from uh, uh, now alert to, to early warning uh, posture. Um, but I, I don't, I, I think even with uh, some um, early warning capability, but it does not uh, mean the change of Chinese uh, nuclear um, strategy or posture, it, because uh, um, the 2019 uh, national uh, white paper, uh, defense uh, white paper shows uh, there's still, as price uh, clearly, uh, China still keeps uh, the no first use in their uh, nuclear strategy even after so many specti uh, spectacles uh, coming up out of uh, many, many uh, countries or, but still keep the, the no first use there. So with the, uh, the same posture, um, some, some early warning um, capabilities can enhance maybe the no first use uh, posture. It seems to me because uh, um, with the other defense and um, uh, missile defense uh, deployment, uh, forward deployment along the Chinese border or other, um, for, for example, the strike, uh, um, hypersonic uh, weapons, uh, specially launched from the space, all that kind of development. Uh, really make the Chinese uh, feel uh, needed to de develop some early warning uh, capability. So that, that, that's the one thing I want to say. Uh, but some people talk about uh, maybe uh, their real concern about the Chinese uh, nuclear development uh, or posture is the entanglement of the nuclear and conventional um, capabilities um, for, but but the, the, the problem is that uh, um, the conventional uh, that that makes a uh, conflict even harder for both China and the United States and um, maybe some people t will talk about uh, the risks of escalation or misperception, misunderstanding between the two countries. Um, but with the, the Chinese side, uh, side's uh, insistence of no first use of posture or policy, I still say uh, it's no very highly uh, at scenario of uh, escalation uh, in the crisis. Thank you very much.
thank you for clarifying a lot of the uh, issues that came up. Uh, I am told that Dr. Sanya has joined us. Uh, Sanya, uh, are you there? Dr. Sanya, uh, ma'am, I can see her in the meet. Uh, ma'am, she's not on. Uh, she's on mute as of now. Ma'am, would you mind unmuting yourself? Sanya, could you please unmute yourself? And also, if you switch on the video, we'll be able to see whether you're there. Um, she's already unmuted herself. She's not speaking anything as of now. Hello. Hi, Sanya. Can you hear us? Hi, Hi Manpreet. Hi, everyone. And I'm very sorry and I apologize for my travel, which inconveniently caused me a massive delay. But I'm here. OK. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, Sanya, uh, what we'll do is uh, we have just about 15 minutes left of this session. Uh, but since you haven't had a chance to speak, uh, can I give you about, uh, say, six, seven minutes? And then there are some very pointed questions that uh, we can take about a minute each for the other speakers. So, Sanya, can you take uh, six minutes, please? Absolutely. Um, so, I will just uh, briefly go ahead and, and skip the details of... Um, uh, historical account of South Asia. Um, I think I would just uh, start with the perspective that how Pakistan tries to see the non-polar Russian regime and keep my focus over there and the rest of the questions or queries I can answer uh, in the question answer session. So let me begin first by saying that Pakistan and India on non-polar Russian regime in broad and arms control share uh, a very similar perspective, but the fact that they both consider the regime as non-discriminatory in nature, but they have a very different point of view why they see it that way. Um, so India's perspective uh, of the regime being discriminatory is because that India is one of the states which is in the outlier after China being allowed as the nuclear weapon state. Pakistan's perspective is very different. Pakistan sees that uh, the regime is actually a nuclear apartheid that deprived nu smaller nuclear weapon states access to nuclear technology uh, without addressing their security concerns. Um, given that fact that Pakistan has been in the past uh, tried for some of the initiatives and proposals uh, for nuclear abstentionism, nuclear weapons free zone, um, and then after 74 uh, test of India, Pakistan started entering into the nuclear uh, weapons program. Uh, the decades later, from 2008 to 2018, we, and we found that Pakistan's nuclear program started into strategic competition with India and then it entered into a domain of recognition factor where Pakistan wanted to be recognized as a non-nuclear weapon state. However, Pakistan can get access to the privileges uh, the way Israel or India was getting. So this um, took Pakistan into a different direction where Pakistan felt there are grievances in Pakistan's program. And that has been voiced by various um, Pakistani strategic thinkers and military planners that Pakistan is not giving um, uh, because of the fact that after 9-11, Pakistan's program came under um, enough limelight from AQ Khan episode and from um, the safety and security of the arsenals. Uh, from 2018 onwards, I would, I would just try to keep uh, my scope limited here, um, that Pakistan's program is now moving towards the survivability challenge. How we can survive the narrative as well as keep Pakistan's strategic competition with India as well as keep um, making its road towards recognition as a, as a nuclear weapon state. Now, having said that, the challenges and the opportunities that Pakistan faces with respect to India is at, uh, is at a broad spectrum. We have challenges at sea, we have challenges at air, um, uh, that Pakistan um, is, is trying to find a route how to uh, avoid Concern that how we want to do we are losing the connection. I think uh, we are voice and the coherence. Can Hello. I 
It's rather unfortunate that we seem to have a bad connection from there and uh, uh, no, um, no, Sanya, we can't hear you. Can you try once more? No, unfortunately, we are not able to uh, get Sanya's voice in here. Um, so while we will try till we have time, but uh, let me ask these few questions that came up in the chat box, uh, which I think is uh, um, is quite an, uh, interesting, and you know it'll be good to get just two line answers. So I'm going to point them to the speaker, and uh, you can take note of them, and then at the end we'll just give you a minute each. Um, I can see Swaran is laughing. One minute is too little, but that's all that we have. Uh, so we have a question from Mr. Aga Sayed, which I'm going to point to Mark, uh, which is about um, uh, what is your sense of uh, Iran's new president and what it will mean for the nuclear deal? Um, uh, Swaran, for you, there was a question uh, from Mr. D.D. Upadhyay, which I think you pretty much answered, which was uh, 50 years on, is the NPT still effective? And I think you did, in a way, answer that, but in case you would like to take that on. Also to Hanhua and to Swaran, I'd, both, uh, I'd like to ask both of you, do you think in the, at the NPT REFCON, can we have the five nuclear weapon states uh, reiterate that statement about nuclear war cannot be won and should not be fought? We've heard it from Biden and Putin. Uh, Ms. Hanhua, do you think that within the NPT, uh, the P5 will be able to make a statement like this at the next uh, review conference? Um, to Sita Kant, specifically, the question is, uh, what is India's present position on NPT and CTBT? There were a couple of other questions by Abhishek Varma, but in the interest of time, yeah. and given that they are not you know, within the ambit of this particular uh, session, uh, I'm going to drop them, but Abhishek can get in touch with uh, Sita Kant or myself, and we can answer those questions later. Frank, to you, I'm putting this question uh, can non-nuclear countries play a role uh, in non-proliferation arms control and disarmament? And this, uh, this question has come from Mr. Raval, who I think is from Nepal, and he's saying, what can non-nuclear countries like Nepal uh, do to help in this particular uh, domain? Uh, and Sanya, I can see you now, though we couldn't hear you, and if you can uh, get your voice through, uh, I'd like you to just comment on uh, what are possibly some of your thoughts on nuclear arms control, not just between India and Pakistan? I think we have some good CBMs and arms control there. But how do we pull China into, the, uh, into this context also? Because it's so difficult to just uh, uh, think of India-Pakistan in a divorced manner from uh, China. So these were the specific questions for all our panelists. And uh, uh, let's uh, begin in the opposite direction. Since we didn't give Sita Khan the turn earlier, Sita Khan, would you like to first take the floor? Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. There are a couple of questions, in fact, but I'd quickly just address them as one by one. Uh, Dr. Sita, Uma Nabi. One minute, huh? You okay, okay, quickly. So there are traditional argument uh, uh, about NPT in India, why we, uh, you know, uh, didn't join it and a lot more traditional argument, I'm not talking about it. But yes, India is known for its non-proliferation credentials and therefore it is considered as a de facto NPT country. But today, when you look at India's position on NPT, uh, you know, after, particularly after Indo-US nuclear deal, what it seems that the Indo-US civil nuclear deal has given a flyover uh, to India to bypass NPT and get all the benefit that uh, it could have received, uh, provided it joined the NPT. So today, uh, the NPT uh, practically, uh, if I put it bluntly, uh, has less uh, practicality, less uh, you know benefit um, for India because we got compensated somewhere or the other by the Indo-US nuclear deal. Uh, CTBT, yes, uh, we have uh, in the same traditional argument, it is neither comprehensive nor test ban because of the you know other system that are available, you can conduct nuclear tests. But yes, uh, just after the nuclear test in 1998, Bajpayee, the prime minister, was thinking about uh, signing the CTBT, but that was on the hold and that, that, that's the end of the story. The th uh, second question that, uh, you know, Abhishek uh, Bauma has asked, does India need to worry about China? Yes, uh, defense modernization and China has always been in the back burner, even go back to the 1960s. 
uh, even Lal Bahadur Shastri was actually shuttling around the world, uh, you know, prompting the entire world about Chinese nuclear test. And then he comes back, gives go ahead for the Subterranean Indian nuclear explosion program. It has always been today, a similar thing happening, whether you like it or not. Yes. And we are in a strategic chain and uh, there is a fantastic, uh, you know, writing about WPS Sidhu was produced. It's called strategic chain, whether you like it or not, we are in a strategic chain with China. The, the interesting question that you have asked is the TNW and, and, and uh, that will take us into another session. Let's okay. keep it for another time. Thank okay. you so much. Sanya, since I can see you, uh, would you like to come in now? Just unmute yourself, Sanya. Manpreet, can you please repeat your comment as soon as you said and, and the connection again dropped? Okay, so I was asking you whether you have any thoughts on nuclear arms control that brings in China also along with India and Pakistan. If you want Yes, to I, I think I, um, space is a, is a very key domain. Uh, the way um, uh, Pakistan and um, China are actually cooperating in space um, and that is a threat uh, that Pakistan feels vis-a-vis uh, India, the way Indian uh, space program is advancing, um, including the entire satellite weapons. Uh, that is the, the domain where Pakistan and China and India can cooperate in future. Um, it is important also uh, because of the cyber and AI technologies, uh, the way these technologies are emerging in the near future, that India and Pakistan can uh, lose this opportunity to find cooperation uh, among each other. And uh, in the very beginning, I think it would be uh, a good opportunity for United States, Russia, and China with very advanced space programs to find some uh, cooperation at this level at the early stages before that everybody is learning, everybody is on the learning curve, uh, that they find some road towards confidence building uh, measures to transform it into um, an arms control. Thank you. Thank you, Sanya. That was clear and crisp. Uh, Ms. Han Hua. Uh, would you like to go on next? Yes. Um, about the P5 uh, statement, drop statement on the nuclear war, uh, I have uh, involved in the P5 um, process. Uh, I mean, uh, the track two, uh, of course, uh, talking about uh, what we can get in, uh, to get out. Uh, for uh, the NPT review conference. I've been there for uh, quite a number of times. Uh, they discussed that um, among the, the five countries, but uh, unfortunately, I could not uh, agree with. Um, and, and also, uh, unfortunately, I mean, China is a very clear cut uh, in that sense. They agree with. Uh, that the uh, statement uh, appear on the final document, no, no, pro no pro problem at all. But uh, I think uh, other countries, especially the, the U.S., uh, has some um, cautions on that. Even with, even that statement, uh, uh, with, even with uh, with some. Uh, revision of that statement is no way to come in uh, to, to come with that statement uh, but other countries uh, some of them they they say uh, they accept that if there's some kind of a minor revision so they i i have seen so m many discussions on that uh, even a simple statement uh, could not uh, get um, consensus among the, the five countries. Right. So I am not so sure we can get that. So we should not be holding our breath on it. Frank, uh, your one minute. Uh, yes, thank you. On whether or not non-nuclear weapon states can play a meaningful role in non-proliferation and disarmament. Um, one, one fact that I think uh, sometimes that we forget is that the, the NPT the original idea for it, the proposal for it, came from that world hyperpower, the Republic of Ireland, um, before it was then taken on by the other states. Um, that, that's one example. Um, we, the, my short answer is yes. Uh, Egypt, for example, at nearly every single NPT review conference is, is often, is always a very powerful voice in terms of holding um, the, the 
nuclear weapon states' feet to the fire regarding their disarmament commitments. And uh, the last example I would give would be from uh, briefly from India's own history, recent history in terms of um, being able to secure the Nuclear Suppliers Group waiver in 2008 and the difficult lobbying of many NSG states, many of them small European non-nuclear weapon states to be able to get their own individual approval. And then following that, the, the long process of Indian lobbying and diplomacy uh, with again, many of these small European non-nuclear weapon states to become a full member. Where it's taken years and years to reach the point now where I think that China is the only holdout um, NSG member state. So uh, the short answer is yes, and there are many examples in history of that happening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You've really given us some good examples to sort of look at. Uh, Swaran, uh, sorry to just give you a minute, but we are left with only two minutes now. Thank you, Manpreet. Let me very quickly try. Uh, the question from Dr. Upadhyay was about uh, the 50 years of NPT. I believe it's been a, a substantial success, at least in horizontal proliferation containment, not in disarmament and not in exchange of civilian technologies to non-nuclear weapon states. What I'm concerned particularly is how rapidly NPT is losing its shine. And therefore, people talk about midlife crisis of NPT. So in that sense, it, it needs to be perhaps uh, uh, revived and uh, protected is what I'm underlining. To the second question, I was delighted to see that my friend Hahua spoke before me and I can easily now stand at variance uh, from what she said. Uh, the statement of P5 uh, becoming a possibility as to whether nuclear weapon, nuclear war cannot be won and should not be fought. Uh, you know, long back, uh, Gorbachev and, uh, and uh, Ronald Reagan in early 1980s had jointly signed that statement already. So I don't see problem between the United States and uh, Russia today. Uh, neither I see a problem with China, which has been also promoting NFU as a possibility. I think bigger problem in signing such a statement will come from France and Britain. And that has to be underlined. European countries, including Germany particularly, are particularly, you know, drifting away from, from the consensus building. And I think equally easy would be not just a joint statement on uh, nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear war cannot be won and should not be fought, but ideas like uh, NFU can be on the table, you know, which can also build consensus uh, that maybe all states, they have done moratorium several times. Why not a joint statement on a subject like this? or delegitimizing, which I underline is much more uh, required today, but which P5 should stand up and initiate some kind of disarmament initiatives, even for the lip service sake, because that is the crisis today, the crisis Thanks. of trust that non-nuclear weapon states do not have anymore in N5. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Swaran. Uh, Mark, you have the last. Uh... Thank you. Well, on your own, I can be very short because the, it's clear now? that uh, even with the, the new president considered as a as a hardliner, a conservative, Iran has a major interest in uh, returning to full compliance with the JCPOA because that's the only way of uh, getting the uh, sanctions, American sanctions lifted. Uh, you know, the end game, of course, may be a little bit difficult uh, because Iran is trying to get some <clears throat> assurances that the, all the sanctions will be lifted and there is no risk of uh, snapback. Uh, so. Um, this is why this, this is just dragging on. But uh, overall, I'm, I'm pretty confident that they will find an agreement. Thank you very much, Mark. You summed it up beautifully. Uh, I have completely enjoyed the session. There was so much here that was you know, worthy of uh, discussion and uh, the way it was put across. Uh, I've often heard that a good session is where you leave with more questions in your mind. So if many of you were not able to get your questions through or are still struggling with these issues, it's been a successful session then. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the panelists. Uh, a big round of applause from me and from everyone else. Uh, all the best. Stay safe, everyone, and hope to run into you uh, physically, not just virtually, sometime soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Manpreet, for sharing it so beautifully. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you very everyone. much. See you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Manpreet, ma'am. Thank you, all the speakers. I now directly hand over to, to Nimesh for the formal word of thanks. Distinguished chair, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, 
As we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express our sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you so much.